And within that edition, there are a number of release packages for things like um, maps or reference sets or subsets of survey. All of those packaged together in the international release. So what goes into the international edition? Well, obviously the content. Um, but then also within the edition, and I'll go read off my screen, you're going to just go. On n'entend plus à distance. Right, can you hear me now? Yep. For those, not for you. <laughs> uh, for those online. Yep. Yep. Excellent. <laughs> This is this is this is going to be great. Good. Yeah. No echo. Excellent. We got rid of the echo. Right. <clears throat> We're all going to get there eventually. Right. So everything. If you look at Snowmed internationally, everything and every release of SNOMED, no matter where you are in the world, will include the international edition. But onto that, you can add additional content, and that's what you add through an extension. Each extension has its own identifier. So we centrally, as in SNOMED International, keep a registry of namespaces. So all the namespaces is a name, obviously, but also an identifier, which is a numeric identifier, which goes along with the code as part of the metadata within the system. So you know where the code originates from. And the international release has its own identifier. Come off it. Um, so namespaces yeah, are required to create globally unique snowbit identifiers. So firstly, it's unique, but also the identifier if you can't read it or have a system that can't read it, you can come to us and we will tell you who owns the namespace, where the code comes from. Um, right, but each of them has a dependency on the other. So if you're building an extension, it has to be dependent on the international release. So you can't build a snowbit extension in a vacuum. It has to be part of or linked to dependent on the international release. The same if you, you know, build a separate extension, it still has to be dependent back on the international edition. And so, whoops, where's this go? Right, so if you think about this in terms of each release, each release will have a release date or a version. So even if you're talking about the version, so the top one here, so the version from uh, the 31st of January 2022, you can have extensions. So it doesn't matter whether the extension was in February or March, they're dependent back on the January release. And then the same on the bottom one, when you're looking at May or April, they're still dependent back on the March release. So there's always a dependency. Uh, one, yeah, don't need that one. Right, so if you're doing a member, so what you'll be doing in France, essentially, is you'll be creating a national edition of SNOMED CT, which will include the SNOMED International Edition, and then it will include a French extension, essentially. Now, whether, you know, whether that's one 
extension that you run nationally or whether you run specific extensions linked together. That's a decision for the NRC to make, not me. But either way, the national edition will be made up of components. The same with if you've got large affiliates in France, if an affiliate creates their own extension, so they want to create Snowmed codes. In the case of affiliates, a lot of time that's to do with metadata and processes within their own um, EHR or their own process um, within their own systems. They can create Snowmed codes, but they need to firstly run it. So they need to create the codes and manage the codes. They also need to create an edition, which will include, if we're talking about France, um, the national edition, so the international edition and the national extensions. Where are we going next? So that's a bit about, uh, actually, let me go back one. So do you have any questions about that bit first? Because we're going we're to start jumping all over the place otherwise. You're clear about extensions. Do you have an idea when uh, the French version of Snowmed City will be released? Um, so we, well, we'll come on to that in a minute about the French version because that's another translation. But yes, and that's one that I'll let Mail kind of put his piece in as well at the same time. Okay, so in the interest of time, translation. So translating Snowmed City. Uh, that's a whole kind of industry in itself, but let's give you the basics and then we can kind of see where we go with the discussion. So within SNOMED, you have a concept. So you have a unique concept ID. That's one. So 2298006. And to that, depending on where you are in the world, you add some descriptions, some terms. So if you're in, I'm not going to try and say this, it's too early in the afternoon, right? So if you're in Spain, you do that. <laughs> um, if you're in Canada and you're doing uh, the English version of the Canadian release, you do that. Um, but either way, where, wherever you are in the world, you will have a unique description associated with that concept. And you, each one of them, it doesn't matter what the actual term is the concept ID will be the same. So irrespective of whether you're in Spain, whether you're in Canada, the triple two nine eight double oh six is the same wherever you are. Um, and the concept, yeah, so we keep we keep it we keep it good in the middle. So <laughs> you were you bloody animation. No, this is good. This is good. So in the terms of the descriptions, there are a number of different description types, first of all, which I think you go on to this one. I can't remember. So these are these are from the, the international release. So every concept will have the uh, the one on the top left. So myocardial infarction brackets disorder is the fully specified name. And every concept in SOMED has a fully specified name. You can always tell them because they've always got a bracketed semantic tag on the end telling you what kind of concept it is. The other descriptions are all synonyms. So, you know, myocardial infarction, heart attack, cardiac infarct, whatever it is, are added within SNOMED as synonyms. And they're also identified as being EN, which is, you know, English. He's, well, in that case, he's, he's US English. Then, but on top of that, if you're in other countries, so you can add synonyms in any language you wish, but they'll exist in SNOMED as synonyms. So yeah, you've got a Swedish version here, you've got a Spanish version, you could have a French version, Estonian version, German, whatever you like. They all get added as synonyms. Right, so the type, yeah. Oh, here we go. So I'm just going to now repeat myself what I've just done. So fully specified name and synonyms. You can tell somebody else has done these slides. It's always good. And like I said at the start, everything is in US English. So when it comes to both creating translations and managing them, the way they're created 
is exactly as I've explained here. So you're, you're essentially adding a synonym in a different language. Within the actual release, which goes back to the whole kind of extension and the national edition, one of the files that goes out in the national edition um, allocates essentially the language preferences. So it will tell you that in this country, in France, if you're looking at the concept myocardial infarction disorder, it will tell you which description is the preferred description. Even though if you go into the whole list of descriptions or the synonyms, even in French, you could have five or six different um, terms associated with that concept. There'll be one which is the preferred term. That's agreed nationally. How they agree differs from country to country. That's his problem, not mine. <laughs> um, there are different ways of doing it. So some some of it is is actually you can do it at the national level. So you can just make a decision nationally. With some of the other clinical specialties, you need to involve clinicians to make the decision because some of it isn't quite as clear cut as that. Uh, where do we go next? Uh, yeah. So so yeah. So if you're in US English, so hang on, let me do these. Right. So if we're talking about US English, and this is what I mean about the language preferences. So in, so if you take the SOMED release in US English in the US, it will identify that <clears throat> the description, the fully specified name will always be there because that has to be there as part of the release anyway, wherever you are in the world. Um, but it will allocate that the preferred description is myocardial infarction. But also if you want to use heart attack, heart attack is acceptable. So you can use heart attack, but the preferred one is myocardial infarction. When it comes to then a vendor building a system, that's what the vendor is using as guidance when, it, when they create their user interfaces. So rather than showing the whole of SOMED and every single term description you can have, we'll limit it to the ones they should have. So, well, why translate? Well, I'm assuming I'm kind of preaching to the converted here, as we would say. But <clears throat> a couple of things to bear in mind with translations. Translations must remain faithful to both the terminology, but also the linguistic principles. And you must be able to produce national terminologies which are useful to clinicians in their daily work. When we started doing, becoming involved in translations, not surprisingly, a lot of the translation work was done via academic institutions. There is a big difference between academic translations and practical clinical translations. And yeah, I'm not, yeah, if you want to know more, there is a hell of a lot of research on linguistics out there. Just go read it up and you'll find out why that's so much is true. The challenges with this and this is where that problem comes from, is it's a balancing act. So on one side, you've got common terms, you've got habits, you've got local practices, you've got you know, a clinical way of doing things, if you like. On the other hand, you know, on the right-hand side, you've got to be unambiguous, you've got to be systematic and consistent. Clinicians are, particularly if you look across specialties, are never systematic and they're never consistent. <laughs> it just, they, they're not. And if you've worked in healthcare for any length of time, you'll know that statement is true. So the heuristics that we you know, drive the translation process is we have an unambiguous, fully specified name. And part of the reason that we have a fully specified name, that thing with a semantic tag, is the terms themselves are completely unique. So if you look at myocardial infarction brackets disorder, that doesn't occur anywhere else in the terminology. When you get into synonyms, that's different. And I'll give you some examples of why that's so in a second. The translation process needs to be transparent. It needs to be psychologically acceptable. So it needs to be human, human acceptable, if you like. It needs to be systematic and consistent, and it needs to be linguistically correct. 
When we have a whole lot of guidance about how you translate SOMED, but one of the keys, you know, the key focus, if you like, is that you translate the contents, the contents, the concepts even. You translate the concepts, not the terms. So concept equivalence is essential. The meaning needs to be maintained. So the example down here, <clears throat> so we have you know, in SNOMED, and you can look it up, a term called globe finding. Now, you know, globe finding, we all live on a globe, right? Called the Earth, okay? We'll just leave the flat Earthers out of this for a minute. But at the moment, it's kind of a circular thing, all right? <clears throat> but in clinical terms, globe finding exists, but globe finding refers to your eye. And the globe, which is in your eye, which is a head finding, it has a finding site structure of the eye, proper as a body structure. So just having the word globe finding doesn't, the words don't always help. And particularly when you translate, it's no good translating globe to mean the earth globe. You need to look at conceptually what it's referring to. So from a concept point of view, the concept represents clinical ideas, meanings, every concept has a unique numeric concept identifier. But when you get down to terms, one term may represent one or more concepts and different terms may represent a single concept when it comes to synonymy. And to give you an example of that, so when the example I used before in the presentation this morning, so myocardial infarction will have a number of synonyms. You can read them there, I'm not going to go through it. If you had a synonym of cold, so cold, dependent on where you are, can mean a number of things. It can mean I feel cold because I haven't turned the heating on. Um, the cold, if you work in respiratory medicine, is also chronic obstructive lung disease. So it's the acronym for, yeah, for chronic obstructive lung disease. But it can also be you know, the virus, the common cold. Right? It's still cold. So within... Snowbed, you can have the word, the words, if you like, the term cold, but it will be associated with different concepts. Um, just in terms of the translation process, so you, know, you read the source term, the hierarchy position is important in terms of what's around it, either parents or children. Um, check the defining properties, so the attributes, the values. Check examples of use where you have them, so how things have been used in practice. And then look at the target language terms, what they are, find the equivalent concept concept in the target language. Just in terms of translation, so Anne, I don't think it was the team, it was Anne. So Anne um, produced this, so there's some guidance around translation just go on this implementation.somed.org for just translation. In terms of the translation into French specifically, um, there are a number of languages globally that are spoken across countries, French being one of them. So we have a group within the SNOMED community called the Common French Translation Group, which Mail is a part of, amongst others. But essentially brings together um, France, kind of obviously, but also Canada because of Canadian French, Belgium and Luxembourg. And Switzerland. And Switzerland, yeah. Oh, forget about Switzerland. Um, but essentially for two reasons, actually. One is to share the translation work, but also to agree, you know, as it says on the box in some ways, to agree a common translation which will be applicable mainly to, across all five countries there will always be differences so the canadians do things in their way which are very different from everybody else leave that where it is um, but there are differences even within europe between languages german is the same um, spanish is the same portuguese is the same and even italian is the same um, but all of that is a work in progress. The idea will be to have a common French translation, which is then taken as part of the French um, edition of SNOMED. 
On translation, any questions? Okay, so in terms of common French translation, the same principles as we said when we looked at different <coughs> synonyms. So within the common French translation, you could have a concept and you could have three or four different French synonyms. When it then comes to the French edition, Mail and the team here would identify which of those French synonyms are applicable to France. Now, maybe you know, out of the four, you might have three which are French, <laughs> um, where the fourth one is Canadian French, which is either confusing or just inaccurate, depending on how you use that the words, if you like, over here. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> So Spanish, Spanish is a bit, in, in some ways Spanish is an oddity, and I don't mean that derogatory as in the language is an oddity, but the, the way the Spanish translation actually comes from the, the work that CAP did and we, we did, as in the NHS, when I worked with my other hat on, that we did back in the mid 90s. And we created a Spanish translation as part of the work that we did in the US because it was mandatory under US law at the time. So first of all, the, the Spanish, the, the SNOMED international release of Spanish is South American Spanish, not Spanish Spanish. So there's a whole kind of confusion there for starters. We're then bringing, that's gradually changing over time. So now Spain is a member and we've got Spain inputting into the Spanish translation. That translation will change over time. Um, but the Spanish one is a bit of an oddity at the moment. But what I've just said about the French translation and the way that's managed also, in, like I say, in terms of German, in terms of Portuguese, in terms of Italian, will be exactly the same um, logical process. So at the moment, ignore Spanish. It's always been a good thing to do anyway, to be fair. <clears throat> OK, so extensions, translations are done. Right. Subsets and reference sets. So reference sets, you won't particularly know what I'm talking about until I tell you. But you've got a rough idea when I talk about subsets, what I mean by a subset. Forget about SNOMED, just in general terms, what a subset is. So why... Why do you want to create subsets and reference sets? Well, this goes back to one of the things I said right back at the start this morning about the size of SNOMED. When, so I've been doing this for a long time. Um, it's interesting that the kind of narrative, if you like, that we use in these sessions has changed over time. It's always been a case that SNOMED is the largest clinical terminology in the world. And if people ask you, or ask me, or you, Ask me, you know, what's the strength of SNOMED? The strength of SNOMED is that it's the biggest terminology in the biggest clinical terminology in the world. What's the biggest downside to SNOMED? The fact that SNOMED is the biggest terminology in the world. It's two sides of the same coin. So when you look at implementing SNOMED, the approach that most vendors will use, and you know, even if you're doing this with um, doing analytics more locally, you'll look at identifying a smaller subset of SNOMED concepts based on a particular use case. So it's identifying normally content that's for a specific requirement. So you can't, so you can't, I suppose you could. Why you'd want to is beyond me. So normally, you know, if you want to create a subset, you have a clear reason why you want to create a subset. There are a set of rules, and then you identify content and it goes into that subset. It's often needed to support a requirement of various levels, either from the point of view of vendors building systems. But if you think about the other end, even from a national level, if you're looking at specifying national data collection 
a lot of that is just identifying the subset of terms that you want. So you're interested in chronic diseases, you couldn't care less about anything else, or you're interested in diabetes, but you don't know about anything else. Um, that can be either a national level, a local level. Some of it we do at an international level. So there are certain subsets or certain value sets that are applicable internationally. There's less of them, but they do exist. The, the standard format we use to distribute any derivative products, any of the reference, so any of the subsets, come back to reference sets in a minute. Um, we use RF2, so we use a specific format. The format obviously identifies what the concepts are, but it also provides a history mechanism, the same as we discussed this morning about SNOMED in general. So when things were in the subset, when they got added equally when they got deprecated over time so you can map over time how that subset has changed the subset reference set debate so a subset is obviously what it says on the tin so it's a smaller grouping of concepts a reference set is the mechanism that we use in snowmed to pull that together and provide the history mechanism and everything else so one is almost the technical standard if you like the other one's the content standard, just in terms of the words. So reference sets, yes, yeah, so represent subsets. The vocabulary is based on um, either local, national or international requirements. Part of it is also considering how you maintain them. So it allows, so, and I'll come to this in a second, but it allows SNOMED content to be constrained for a specific purpose. So if you think about SNOMED as the whole, the subset contains a, a group of terms, but they have to come from SNOMED. You can't have a SNOMED subset with something from outside. Now, you know, SNOMED can be, doesn't have to be the international release of SNOMED. So SNOMED wherever you are. So if you're here, as in, in Paris, if you were to take the French edition, that would be what was in that hole. So a subset would be anything from within the French edition. Um, right, so the, this is this is practical advice. If you want to ignore it, feel free. But this is based on experience. <laughs> um, if you're going to create a subset for any reason, don't do what a lot of people do, which is go to the browser, whether that be our browser or any Snowbird browser, and type in whatever term you want. And you'll get a list of concepts and you go yeah that looks good we'll have that. and there's your, that's going to be my subset there's two reasons why that's a bad idea one goes back to what i said this morning that you're assuming that what you're searching for that's the only description that appears in those terms and i've shown you this morning that's not the case <laughs> so one that's a bad idea so rather than doing that actually define what set of requirements what is it you want to build forget about what goes in the subset but what does the subset need to cover then do the search based on those requirements not on the words the requirements need to be at the detailed level so you know it's either looking at content that you already know in existing records if it's particular content from assessment scales or pre-formatted nursing plans, there's a whole variety of stuff which you know the data items are there, which will help you build that up. The reason, and let me just go back a minute, right, the reason this is important goes back to what I said about on the previous slide about maintenance. If you're going to maintain a subset over time, SNOMED changes over time, and that will always be the case because clinical practice changes over time. If you want to keep that subset tight and keep it fit for purpose in terms of the requirements, the only way to do that is if you document the requirements up front. There's some practical you know, advice about how you build them. So you know, do you go through SNOMED saying, I have one of those, 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 and there's my subset? Or are you a bit more clever and go through and identify hierarchies and say, well, actually, I want these 10 concepts, but actually they're all children of this single concept of a book. So we'll identify the single concept and everything below it. 
there are different ways of, of specifying it. They have an impact on the way you maintain it. So if you specify something as a hierarchy, it's easy to maintain over time because unless the top level changes, it doesn't matter what changes below it, it will automatically update. There are some international subsets that we do, as in some of the international do. They're based on international use cases. The usual one is through a group of subject matter experts that um, either I chair or one of my colleagues chairs. It's often done in collaboration with professional organisations globally. So things like um, there's a group called Wonka, which do the World Organisation of Family Doctors and General Practitioners. We do ones with ICN, so the International Council of Nursing, that kind of thing. Um, the current subsets we have, this is an exhaustive list, but it's just to give you an example. We've got a couple for dentistry, so the odontogram, general dentistry diagnosis. There are a couple of nursing ones around health, nursing actions um, and health issues, and also one around reasons for encounter and health issues for general practice. At the national level, so exactly the same logic applies. So yeah, they develop to meet specific national use case requirements. They can include content from the international or the national releases, but it's got to be within those two. You can't have one here run by, you know, included in a national subset, something from a vendor's extension. It's got to be from one of those two. Um, if you're going to create a national subset, you've got to manage, you've got to publish it, and it has to be managed through the National Release Centre. You have a way of nationally managing and publishing it. Um, with some of them, when I look around countries, specifically in Europe that I look after, a lot of them come out with specific implementation guidance, so they tend to be linked to something else. Um, they're available to, obviously to people, if you're talking about France, they're obviously available to people in France. Um, but they're also available to review by other CERBED member countries and licensees. So you can share some of the derivatives and subsets from Germany, from Belgium, from Spain, wherever you like. Local subsets, just to make you aware of it. So any SNOMED licensee under the SNOMED affiliate license has the ability to apply for a namespace. Um, if they've got a namespace, they can create their own contents, their own derivative products, and they can do that at the local level. We can't stop them. And more to the point, you can't stop them. <laughs> um, but if they're going to do that, um, they need to take, you know, it's a bit like having a child grow up in some ways. They have The responsibility comes with the flexibility to do that. So they have to have an infrastructure in place to maintain and update the subsets over time, particularly if they're going to use them. What they, is really common from a local level and vendor perspective is developing user interfaces and developing subsets to support that. If they're developing decision support systems where you, you're identifying subsets of terms to actually drive the decision support algorithms, where you're looking at implementation of local clinical guidelines within EHRs. So, you know, if you live in the UK, we have locally, we have local formularies. So there's certain drugs, only certain drugs can be prescribed within certain areas and it's different across the country. Um, what's this one, right. <clears throat> so this, I think, hang on, let me put this, this, yeah, I'll put them all up first. I'll just talk through them. Um, the usual thing, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this in the interest of time more than anything else, but there's uh, some of this is actually on our own website that you can actually link into these. But it's a set of slides I did for clinicians, really asking the questions that you should go through as a clinician when you're involved in creating a subset. So, you know, why do you need them? What's going to go in the subset? Who and how will it be used? What's the usage? Is it local, national, international? And then the important one at the end is who will be responsible for the creation and maintenance of the subsets. It can't be one person. So it's no good saying, you know, the national subset for whatever over here, we're going to go, male's going to be the one that's going to be responsible for this. And then in 18 months' time, he gets promoted, and everybody's going, oh, what am I going to do with the subset? 
So it can't be identified to one person, but it does need to have an owner. Uh, hang on. I was actually going to. So, yeah, the, I'm not going to run through these. The, the same thing occurs at an international level. So, if you come to us with a, a use case requirement for an international subset, these are the things we're going to ask you. Um, yeah, exactly the same. We want supporting documentation, clear description of how it's going to be used and what's going to go in there. Uh, if you're looking at international subset developments, all requests come through Snowman International. They're all reviewed by initially by me. Um, if we pursue it, then we have to commit resources to it. So it goes through um, a whole thing with our senior management team. It also means we've got to identify a group of SMEs to work out what goes in it and how it's maintained over time in terms of an editorial group. Uh, this one, I'm just going to go through quickly, but these are some questions that we get asked all the time. So if you're creating a subset, how many concepts is too many? How many is too few? Right, so how big a subset should you have? There's no limit upper or lower to the amount of concepts. Um, it's dictated by the use case requirement. So you could have a concept with 150,000 concepts. You could have a subset with two. There isn't an upper low limit. Should we put concepts into a hierarchy? Um, that goes back to what I've just said. So you know, if you're specifying a subset and you can use a hierarchy within SNOMED, that is an easier way of doing it. Um, you don't need to put them into a hierarchy, but identifying a hierarchy is preferable, if you like. Um, yeah, so reaching consensus, however you do this, you're going to need to get consensus about what content goes in the subset and what goes out. That's not easy, and that goes back to being very clear on the requirements in the first place. How long does it create a list <laughs> to create a list of concepts? It's a bit, as we were saying in the UK, it's a bit like how long is a piece of string, right? So it takes as long as it takes. Some requirements will be very simple, some will be very complex. So some will take you in terms of days, some will take you in terms of months. <coughs> there's no optimal time, so there's no you know, ideal time it takes you this long. Um, once you've created them, what do you do next? Well, creating an initial list of concepts is helpful, but then you've still got to go through the process of what's the requirements, looking at the documented scope, not just in terms of how you build it, but how you maintain it going forward. Um, this I'm just going to fly through. So maps, just to mention maps, because we've, we've kind of touched on this both Anne and I previously. A map is the bit that sits between. So if you've got SNOMED and you've got another code system, in terms of inter interoperability, a map sits in the middle. Um, one con, you know, if you're looking at a one-to-one -one map, Right, so one code system, another code system, all you're doing is saying this concept in SNOMED is equivalent to this concept in whatever the other one is. And that can be either way. So it's just a one-to-one -one map. It could be from SNOMED to, well, we use ISD10 as an example. So you could do, it could be from SNOMED to ISD10, one-to-one. It could also be the other way around. So it could be ICD10, to SNOMED. That isn't the case in most things, and I'll tell you why in a second. <coughs> when you talk about a map, all maps have direction. So when you say a SNOMED to ICD map, I mean what I say. So you're starting from SNOMED and you're going to ICD. So it has direction. Um, you can have bidirectional maps. So you can have things which um, are the same either way. They're the exception rather than the rule. Most, most ones will have a direction and they will be different in different directions. Um, so if you take the example here, so in SNOMED we have also the foot. In MEDRA you have foot also. Nice and simple one, one to one. This one if you've got in SNOMED, you've got a blister of the ankle with an infection. Not a problem, except that 
in ICD-10, that fits under other superficial injuries of ankle and foot, a local infection of skin and subcutaneous tissue unspecified. So it'll have one to many um, if you look at it in that terms. So what happens when an exact match isn't possible? So in, uh, well, let's say in SOMED, because in SOMED we do have diabetes type 1, but in, in a terminology you have just diabetes. But that maps then to diabetes mellitus type 1. So you've got a broad to narrow map, so a broad uh, description down to a narrow focus. Equally, the other way around, so you've got arthritis of the knee is a broad concept, mapping to arthritis of the left knee. Now, so why, why am I pointing that and why is it important? Well, map represents, the, the purpose of the map needs to be very clear. So one, when you create a map, you create a map for a particular use case. It needs to be very clear what the use case is. The use case will dictate the rules which go along to the way the map is created and also maintained over time. It can be a one-to-many, many-to-one, or many-to-many -many maps. The How you decide, if you like, about how that's um, implemented, there is there are two main ways of doing it. So one is an automated selection. So if you have a specified map, you can run it through a system and the system will say if I have this SNOMED code and it's a one-to-one -one map, it's one of these in whatever the other code system is. Great, works really well. You could do a manual selection. So it could be just, you know, you've got here's SNOMED and here's the other one and you've got a clinical code in between working out which one's which. In reality, it tends to be the last one here. It tends to be a combination of automated process with manual confirmation. So think about the automated process almost giving you a default map and then you know, the clinical coder or the clinician between making the assertion of which one is correct. Um, so if you use, yeah, I'm just thinking which one example it is. So in SOMED, we have measles, we have measles without complication, we have atypical measles. All of those map through to the ICD-10 code of B0 5.9, so measles without complication. Equally, you, know, you in SNOMED the other way around, you've got otitis media caused by influenza A, but that maps to it's two here, the ones cut off the um, description, but you've got influenza um, not specified and then you've got elsewhere classified, so it maps through to two things in ICD. But the way you decide, so when you, if you're mapping in real life as opposed to just creating a map, you need to choose one of those. And there's we produce as part of the release the mapping advice that goes along with the file. So we'll create the map, but we'll also produce the mapping advice that says, in these circumstances, use this code. If not, use this code. And to give you a practical example of that, so we have a code in Stobed called infertile. In ICD, there's female infertility and male infertility. You need to know which way round it is. I would suggest, <laughs> or oh, depend on where you want to go with that one. Uh, I'm going to stop there. So that's kind of like a, a rapid tour of everything else that you need to know. Question? So there are, you could, and that goes back to the, that goes back to specifying the use case for where you want to do this. So I'm not, I'm not arguing that we shouldn't have in SNOMED a male infertility and a female infertility. But if you look in ICD-10, female infertility unspecified has a very clear meaning. It doesn't mean just female infertility. It means specific elements of infertility are included within that code. Now, to include one code with female infertility is one thing. 
to create a code with that level of description in it would almost make it unusable by a system because of the way that's defined in ICD-10. Mm -hmm. But the reason why we also have this is because the map from SNOMED to ICD-10 is maintained every month. So every concept in the scope uh, of the map in SNOMED to see will always be mapped to ICD-10. So that it can always come from the clinical documentation using SNOMED to some reporting using ICD-10. So that's our goal, that we always mm. have a map okay. to some activities in the from to see. So that's why we both have a map to split the rule when you use the broader infertility concept. But we also, if you use the more specific one, you derive, there's no rules because then the, the rule is not necessary because it's female. <coughs> yeah. 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 You're convinced. No, you kind no, of no, you no. look half convinced, man. We have a demonstrator. I will go with the lips. Uh, so if we take So this is like a demonstrator of these maps. And if we just take the first one, here it is again. It's annoying. If I take infertile, get that. You can see the rule down here. Do you see it? No, it's a little bit. It's a bomb you screen. It's not, it's not updated. If I take infertile. Just share the. Yeah, but I am, but it's not refreshing. <laughs> and this is my screen. It's not refreshing. Yeah. You want to use it through. What do you want to do? Try and access it through mine. Let me try access. I can just try again. Should I just try again? Okay. What do Share. Your screen. Oh, that's freaking alarm. So this one, so if you see here, if you take infertile, uh, if you click on that button, let me just try. If I click here, so this exemplifies that you have a patient, it's a female patient of the age of 35. And then if you have this nomad concept, infertile, you can automatically derive, then, then it must be the ICD-10 code of female infertility, because you include the rule from the metadata there's a gender here, female, which is probably coded. But the rule, how it looks in the reference set that we distribute, are these rules. So let's say that we had a, a male, and we refresh, um, it would be male infertility. But we could also have a concept in SNOMED. Uh, I will show you that when I show you browser, that we have female infertility, and that maps to the same. So if you selected that SNOMED concept, it would end up with the same ICD-10 code. Yeah. 